We've proven that convergent sequences and their limits behave very nicely with respect to addition, subtraction, multiplication, and even being multiplied by a constant. Now we've got one more thing to prove. We'll prove that if the sequence an converges to a and the sequence bn converges to b, then the sequence an over bn converges to a over b, provided, of course, that b is not equal to zero and each bn is not equal to zero. Because if b is zero, then a over b is undefined. And if any bn is equal to zero, then this sequence is undefined. Your first thought might be, wait a minute, isn't dividing the same as multiplying by a reciprocal? So the sequence an over bn, that's the same as an multiplied by one over bn. And then perhaps we could conclude that this sequence converges to a over b because we've already proven the limit law for the product of sequences. And there will be links in the description to my lessons proving all the previous limit laws. This idea is good. The only problem is we would need to prove that the sequence bn can converging to b implies that the sequence 1 over bn converges to 1 over b. If we can do that, then we're golden. Here's the logic we just went through one more time. We're saying that if the sequence bn converging to b, with b not equal to zero and each bn not equal to zero, if that implies that the sequence 1 over bn converges to 1 over b, then we'll have our proof done and over with for the quotient of sequences. Because the sequence an over bn is equal to the sequence a n times 1 over b n, and then by the limit law for the product of sequences, this would converge to the product of the limits, a times 1 over b, which is a over b. So all we have to do is prove this implication. b n converges to b, b isn't zero, no term of b n is zero, so we need to prove that the sequence 1 over b n converges to 1 over b. Let's do it. Our proof, of course, will begin with an epsilon greater than zero. Then we'll need to set some value for big N. Let's go ahead and do some work to figure out what the heck that's gonna have to be. We know in our proof, we'll have to show that the distance between terms of our sequence, one over B N, and the desired limit, one over B, is eventually less than epsilon. To see what we might be able to do to reach that goal, let's try combining one over B N and minus one over b into the same fraction. To do that, we need to give them common denominators. So we'll multiply one over bn by b over b, giving us b over b times bn. Similarly, we'll have to multiply one over b by bn over bn. So we have minus bn over b times bn. And then bringing those into the same fraction gives us the absolute value of b minus bn divided by b times bn. And now this is starting to look all right. The absolute value of a division is the same as the division of the absolute values. So this is equal to the absolute value of b minus bn divided by the absolute value of b times bn. And then the order of subtraction within absolute value bars doesn't matter, so we could flip this around to be bn minus b. And that is nice because we can make this as small as we want since bn converges to b. Just how small are we going to want to make this numerator? Well, remember, keep the end goal in mind, we want all of this to be less than epsilon. How small the numerator has to be, of course, depends on what's going on down here in the denominator. We can split this denominator up into pieces a little bit because in the same way that the absolute value of division is equal to the division of the absolute values, the absolute value of multiplication is the same same as the multiplication of the absolute values. So this is equal to the absolute value of bn minus b divided by the absolute value of b 
times the absolute value of bn. Tentatively, we might say that we want the absolute value of bn minus b to be less than epsilon times the absolute value of b. Then if we replaced this with this, the absolute value of b would cancel out with the absolute value of b in the denominator, and we'd be left with epsilon. But that is, of course, ignoring this absolute value of bn term, which is going to be a little tricky. In our proof of the limit law regarding the product of sequences, it was useful for us to notice that the absolute value of bn is bounded since bn is a convergent sequence. That way, we were able to put an upper limit on how big that could possibly be. However, since we're trying to make this expression small and the absolute value of bn is in the denominator, putting a limit on how big it can get doesn't help us. The absolute value of bn will cause problems because it can get small, which would make this whole expression big. So in order to figure out what's going on here, we're going to have to create some definite separation between the absolute value of bn and zero. The idea behind what we're going to do is that since we know bn converges to b and b is not equal to zero, eventually the absolute value of bn must be pretty close to b and maybe not so close to zero. Then we could put a definite lower bound on how small it is and cancel out whatever that happens to be with our absolute value of bn minus b because we can make that as small as we need to to deal with what's going on in the denominator. All right, let's dig more into the details. This is really cool, I promise you. So we're hoping to be able to say something like this. Eventually, bn is sufficiently close to the limit b, so the distance between them is less than something, say x, and this inequality will hopefully imply something useful about the absolute value of bn. We don't know what this x should be, but let's just ignore that for now, because the more pressing problem is that in order to get this inequality to tell us anything about the absolute value of bn, we're going to need to get an absolute value of bn term somewhere and solve for it. So how can we do that? In our previous proofs of limit laws, we made great use of the triangle inequality theorem, but it's not obvious that we can apply that here because we don't have the addition of terms in the absolute value bars. Sometimes when we have subtraction in the absolute value bars, we find it useful to subtract and add something, and then we can apply the triangle inequality theorem in order to split the expression at the addition that we introduced. However, here we know that we're just trying to solve for the absolute value of bn, so we might shy away from introducing more stuff into this inequality. Instead, then, we may choose to apply the reverse triangle inequality. That tells us that the absolute value of the difference of two things is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the difference of their absolute values. So the absolute value of bn minus b is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the absolute value of bn minus the absolute value of b. This looks pretty good because now we've introduced an absolute value of bn. Again, the order of subtraction within absolute value bars doesn't matter, so I'm going to go ahead and switch the order of subtraction here. So we have the absolute value of b minus the absolute value of bn. We'll see soon that ends up being useful. Now, we would really like to get rid of these outer absolute value bars. Thankfully, that is something we can do. This is greater than or equal to itself, but without the absolute value bars. Because, of course, if this is positive, then it's equal to this. If this is negative, then it's less than this. So this is definitely greater than or equal to this, just dropping those outer absolute value bars. Finally, simplifying what we're working with here, we've got that the absolute value of b minus the absolute value of bn is less than x. So we know we can make this as small as we want, 
We're going to make it less than something, but we're not sure what yet, so we're just calling it x. Now we know, whatever we make this less than, we also have that this is less than that. Now let's just finish solving for bn. We might multiply both sides of this inequality by negative 1 in order to make bn positive. Doing that will change this on the left into the absolute value of bn minus b. It will flip the inequality to be greater than, and our x will become minus x. Then, of course, we have that the absolute value of bn is greater than the absolute value of b minus x, just adding the absolute value of b to both sides. Finally, we can start to ask, what would it be useful to set x equal to? Remember, x is basically playing the role of an epsilon here, so it can be any positive number. Remember, the goal is to guarantee some distance between the absolute value of bn and 0, so we would like this on the right to be greater than 0. Since we've got the absolute value of b minus x, why don't we have x be half the absolute value of b? And just like that, it's as if x was never even here. Remember that b is not equal to 0, so the absolute value of b over 2 is definitely a positive number. Thus, we can eventually have that the absolute value of bn minus b is less than the absolute value of b over 2, since bn converges to b. And when that's true, by all the work we previously did, we have that the absolute value of bn is greater than the absolute value value of b minus half the absolute value of b, which of course is equal to half the absolute value of b. And so now we're getting somewhere. Now let's apply the definition of a convergent sequence to get a big n value. So because bn converges to b, we know there exists some natural number big n1, so that for every n greater than big n1, the absolute value of bn minus b is less than the absolute value of b over 2. And we just did the work to show that when that is true, we have that the absolute value of bn is greater than the absolute value of b over 2. That means in this expression up here that we're really interested in, if we replace the absolute value of bn with half the absolute value of b, we will only be making the expression as a whole bigger because we'll be dividing by a smaller number. Let's go ahead and try that out and we'll be able to clear up the rest of the details of this proof. I'm going to shrink this work down and set it over here. So what we've got so far is our proof would take an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero, then we'd consider n greater than big N1, which is the big N1 we identified before. And when n is greater than big N1, we know that we can replace the absolute value of bn here and make the expression bigger. So this is less than the the absolute value of bn minus b divided by the absolute value of b times the absolute value of b over 2. Our original plan was to make this numerator less than epsilon times the absolute value of b. But now we see in the denominator we're going to have to cancel out an additional factor of absolute value of b and a factor of 1 half. So we'll actually want to make this less than epsilon times the absolute value of b squared all divided by 2. Thankfully, since bn converges to b, we can do that no problem. Remember, epsilon is positive and the absolute value of b is positive, so this number is positive, so by definition of bn converging to b, we know there exists a natural number big N2, so that for every n greater than big N2, the absolute value of bn minus b is less than epsilon absolute value of b squared over 2. Finally, to actually put the bow on our proof, we see that our big N of big N1 isn't quite going to do. We're going to need to take the maximum of big N1 and big N2 to make sure that we get both of the inequalities that we need. So we take an arbitrary epsilon, set big N equal to the maximum of big N1 and big N2. Then we know for all N greater than big N, we consider the distance between terms of our sequence 1 over bn and the desired limit, 
1 over b. The work we did earlier demonstrated that's equal to this. Then, since n is greater than big N1, we were guaranteed that the absolute value of bn is greater than the absolute value of b over 2. So by putting that smaller number in the denominator, we get a bigger number. Similarly, since n is greater than big N2, we know that the absolute value of bn minus b is less than epsilon times the absolute value of b squared over 2. So we replace that with a bigger number, and we have that this is less than epsilon times the absolute value of b squared over 2 over the absolute value of b squared over 2. My oh my, would you look at that? Those cancel out. This is equal to epsilon. Thus, given any epsilon greater than 0, we can find a number, big N, so that every term of our sequence after the big nth term is within epsilon of 1 over b. Thus, if a sequence bn converges to b with b not equal to 0 and each term of the sequence not equal to 0, then the sequence of reciprocals 1 over bn converges to the reciprocal of the limit 1 over b. Thus, by the limit law for the product of sequences, the sequence an times 1 over bn converges to a times 1 over b, which is a over b. And of course, a n times 1 over b n is equal to a n over b n. Hence, if a n converges to a, b n converges to b, and b is not equal to 0, and no term of b n is equal to 0, the sequence a n over b n converges to a over b. The quotient of convergent sequences converges to the quotient of their limits. <laughs>